Welcome to our continuing series of the great chapters from the Old Testament. This series is a compilation of a previous collections of daily devotionals that combine the Old Testament and the New Testament. Our study here is simply ones from the Old Testament. Now to say that some chapters are great while others are not so great, nothing could be further from the truth. I've stated many times that every chapter is great in the Bible because it is inspired by God, and it has been recorded and preserved for us down through the centuries. I've endeavored to choose some of the most well-known chapters, and some that are not quite so well-known, uh, to read them with adding a, just a few words from a devotional thoughts for, to that chapter. Now combined, the reading of the devotional's thoughts range from about 10 minutes, some a little more, some a little less for each chapter that we have covered. In our first compilation last week in their class, we looked at four chapters from the book of Genesis. Chapter 1, the creation account. Chapter 6, the account of the Genesis flood. Chapter 12 of Genesis, the calling of Abraham. And finally, last week, we looked at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19. In our lesson tonight, we'll look at four more great chapters, two from the book of Job and two more from the book of Genesis. Our first lesson tonight comes from Job chapter 1, entitled Job, Blameless and Upright. Next is Job 38, God Answers Job. Then we'll come back to the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 22, God Tests Abraham. And finally, in tonight's lesson, Genesis chapter 27. Isaac blesses Jacob. Again, as I have stated before, these are not great pontifications, theologically speaking, nor are they a word-by-word, -word, verse by verse study, but rather just a general overview of the chapter. Just enough to whet our appetites and thereby sparking an interest to, to further read and study the book of books, the Holy Bible. And now, let's get started with our lesson today. Welcome to another of the great chapters in the Bible. Our chapter for consideration today is from the Old Testament book of Job. Job chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, and five hundred female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. 
And the Sabaeans fell upon them, and took them, and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. You know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. I've heard that pose from time to time. I have a few questions I'd like to know. Mostly science stuff. You know, the big ones about creation and dinosaurs and the speed of light. Yeah, really important stuff, I know. Still, there is the great looming question that mankind has pondered and pined for over the centuries and millennia. That is the question of why all the pain and suffering? We stumble through this subject as best we can to console those who endure pain and sorrow and suffering here now. Yet it is usually time that brings healing, if at all. The book of Job has been called by many one of the greatest pieces of literature in the world. And that's pretty good company. The first time I read the book of Job was as a teenager in, of all things, a high school world literature class. I couldn't grasp what was going on. A rich man, the devil, and God, and three so-called friends going back and forth about what he did wrong. Even today, these handful of years separated from my high school years, I struggle with the complexity of this book and the questions posed. We are introduced to Job and his family in chapter 1. The exact date of the events of this book are unknown. Beyond this book, Job is mentioned only three other times in Scripture, twice in Ezekiel and once in the New Testament letter to James. As to those who doubt that Job really existed, that in reality this is a work of allegory or a parable or a legend, well, all I can say is you just haven't really examined the evidence and leave it at that. Now, I could ramble on about the internal evidences, but for the skeptic there is never enough evidence. But if you'd like to read about the origins of Job, I would recommend Albert Barnes' notes on the book of Job. So in the little bit of time that we have here together, let's peer into what we have been given in this most intriguing of chapters, chapter 1 of Job. We're given a brief biography of Job in the opening verses, enough to give us insight into his character, blameless and upright, and as the patriarch, one who cared about his family. His possessions put him as one of the greatest of all the people of the East. And by my count, there are some 351 questions posed in this book. But the first two asked by God set the tone for what is about to happen. The first is asked to Satan by God, from where have you come? Now, God knew exactly where Satan had been because the next question is not one of which God plunks Job before Satan to see if he can break him but one which God knows that Satan has set his eye upon him. In verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? In effect, have you set your heart on Job? As Scripture unfolds for us, we learn more about the nature of Satan. For Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded and watchful. 
Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And that's exactly what he's doing here in the book of Job. John records in Revelation about what Satan seeks to do to us. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them night and day before God. Now, we have the first accusation made against Job by Satan when he asked in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Isn't that just like the devil? Indeed, his nature has not changed from the garden. Jesus knew this when he spoke to the Jews in John 8, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do the father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. God allows Satan to carry out his plans in an attempt to prove that man cannot possibly love God if he has everything taken from him. His servants, his livestock, his children, all gone in one fell swoop. What happened proves the worthiness of Job. To feel the grief and pain of loss that deep and yet not find fault with God or blame Him in any way tells us of that character spoken of in the very first verse of this book and deals a mighty blow against the accuser here in Job 1, 21 and 22. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. To grasp the concept that all we have is from God is a monumental statement of faith. Far too often we may think that what we have is that which we have of our own strength, intellect, and ingenuity contrived for ourselves. Yet the wise mind realizes we are but servants and stewards of all we possess. But Satan is not through with Job and once again in chapter 2 sets his heart on destroying this upright and blameless man by taking his health. As the book goes on, we shall meet the likes of Zophar, Eliphaz, and Bildad, and Elihu. Job's wife will resoundingly rebuke Job for his faith. But in the end, God will have the final answer. But we'll leave that for another lesson. What is the takeaway from this remarkable book? Does it give us the definitive answer once and for all as to the reason and cause of all suffering in this world? If you're looking for an easy answer to plug into each and every situation in life that will satisfactorily assuage every person's need in their moment of sorrow, well, you won't find it. At least not in the way you think. Solomon writes with wisdom when he tells us in Ecclesiastes 3.11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Yes, God has set eternity into our hearts, the ability to see beyond what the common creatures around us do. We understand there is more to this life than eating and procreating. Yet we cannot, we simply cannot, for all our abilities to reason, see the whole picture. When God answers Job in the end, his series of questions and illustrations make Job and us realize that God alone can grasp such things. And on that day when we shall see the Lord face to face, it may be that it is not questions that we have, but praise and adoration for His wisdom. Is that enough for you? And Lord willing, 
Let's meet again tomorrow and look at another of the great chapters in the Bible. Welcome to another in our series, Great Chapters of the Bible. Our chapter today is Job chapter 38. God answers Job. We'll begin in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning, since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light, and where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft the channels for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land? and to make the ground sprout with grass. Has the rain a father, or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth, and who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Mazareth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions, when they crouch in their dens, or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey, when its young ones cry to God for help, and wander about for lack of food? I have spent my fair share of time in the hot seat, so to speak, when I was young. At times I was unruly riding the bus, in principal's office, lectured by my parents. And I have to say, I didn't enjoy it at all that much. I don't really know of anyone who relished that time of being chastised for bad behavior. It was usually worse the moment I was told, we need to talk. It's then I knew I was in trouble. If you have read the book of Job, you know that the storyline has wound its way back and forth and around and around until it arrives here in chapter 38. We've heard the different viewpoints on the nature of Job's problems and various philosophies pertaining to the nature of pain and suffering and 
crime and punishment by Job and his friends, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad, and then Elihu. Now it's God's turn to set things straight. But after all, that's what Job wanted. In fact, he specifically desired an audience with God to air out his grievances. In Job chapter 13 and verse 22, we read, Then call, and I will answer. Or let me speak, then you respond to me, speaking to God. And again in Job 23, 3-6, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. And I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. And still again in Job 31, verse 35, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. There are times when we get rather full of ourselves. We have the answers of how the president or governor ought to run things and can't figure out why they can't see it as clearly as we do. We deride the businesses we work for or where we shop or the teams we root for and long to give them a piece of our mind. But I wonder how bold we would be if we really did have the chance to sit down and face to face with them, show them how it ought to be done. God gives Job this very opportunity to show him how it ought to be done. But before he does, God has a few questions. He would like Job to answer. A sort of, if you're so smart, then answer these questions. However, the first statement God makes puts Job in his place and gives perspective to the whole matter. In verse 2 of Job 38, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? In effect, in all of Job's rantings, he has actually done a disfavor and given God a black mark for his handling of the situation. Job hadn't seen the big picture. What God follows with in this chapter and the preceding chapters after this is a series of questions aimed at showing Job the wisdom of God by way of creation. It is what Solomon would refer to in Proverbs 8, 22-24. Concerning wisdom, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of His way, before His works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. When there was no depths, I was brought forth when there were no fountains abounding with water. To this day, should we consider each of the questions individually or as a whole, we would be in absolute awe. In the end, Job will come to realize the wisdom of God, for he states in chapter 42, verses 2 through 6, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I recall a humorous little account that tells of a group of scientists that believe they have discovered how to bring lifeless matter to life and boasting to God so much. When they desire to show God their work in a rather boastful way, they tell Him all they need is a handful of dirt and they can prove their claim. God agrees, but tells them in order to do so, they must bring their own dirt. As God proceeds in this chapter and the chapters that follow, He brings to light, so to speak, the elemental things of this world. The foundations of the earth, its measurements and the cornerstones in the deep in verses 4 through 6, the sea below and the clouds above and the powers that hold them in verses 8 through 11, the coming forth of the dawn and its changing beauty and the curiosity of the way the light has always had a way of dispersing the evil in this world in verses 12 through 15. In case after case, God continues and challenges Job Where were you? Tell me if you have the understanding in verse 4. Surely you know in verse 5. Who who shut in the sea in verse 8? Have you commanded, so to speak, in verse 12? Have you entered? Verse 16. Have you done this? Where is the way and what is the way? Can you do this? 
who, what, where, when, from the depths of the sea to the far reaches of space that takes in the stars and the constellation, rain, snow, dew, water, and ice, over and over the beauty and majesty of this world and the order and design are brought to Job's and our attention to show us the Maker's wisdom. I wonder sometimes if many of the questions you and I might have would be belayed if we simply stepped out in the quiet of the morning and observed the universe around us and resigned ourselves to let God take charge of our lives since He has shown us His ability to do so already in creation. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 19-20, through 20, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. What do you think? Is God capable of controlling this world? And Lord willing, let's meet again tomorrow and look at another of the great chapters of the Bible. Welcome to another great chapters in the Bible. Our chapter today is Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, God tests Abraham. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on, his, on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a, sac as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven, and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now after these things it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Uz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Chezid, Hatzo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. 
These ate Milcah, born to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Ruamah, bore Teba, Gaham, Tehash, and Mehiakah. Mr. Smith was my fifth grade science teacher. He had a very simple approach for his class as it pertained to learning the material and taking tests. On Monday, he handed out the worksheet for the week, and on Friday, we took a test on that very same worksheet. All we had to do was memorize the answers that we filled in the blanks, and we could get an A on every single test. That worked out pretty well until he changed his system a few months into the school year. Then it became more than memorization. We then had to understand the context. It is the test that proves whether or not we have grasped the material. Some people are good with true and false on tests, some with multiple choice, some with fill in the blanks, some with matching. Each has its own unique way of challenging us as to what and how much we learned. Then we have the dreaded essay questions. That's where we really show whether or not we understand that material. Teachers are trained to use a variety of methods to help students grasp that which they are to learn and then various ways in which to prove that the child has understood what is taught. The debate rages as to whether teachers should teach to the test, so to speak, or teach for comprehension. But that's for another discussion. What we are interested in here is the test. For that is what God puts before Abraham to show his faith. The King James Version translates the Hebrew word nasa as tempt. The American Standard Version translates that word as prove. Almost all other translations, the English Standard Version, which I read here, the New International Version, the New King James Version, the New American Standard, etc., use the word tested. If our math is somewhat correct, then this event takes place some 40 years after Abraham's call from Ur of the Chaldees in Genesis 11. In 40 years, what had Abraham been faced with to prepare for this test? Well, as been noted in Genesis 11 and 12, Abraham left his home and family there and ventured to an unknown land. He makes a trip to Egypt in chapter 12 where he pretends Sarai is his sister to avoid being killed by Pharaoh. He and Lot go their separate ways in chapter 13. He then has to rally the troops and rescue Lot in chapter 14. He meets Melchizedek on his way home from rescuing Lot in chapter 14. God makes a covenant with Abraham in chapter 15, and Abraham believes and it is counted to him as righteousness. In chapter 16, Sarai becomes impatient, waiting for an heir, and convinces Abram to have a child with Hagar. In chapter 17, God forms the covenant of circumcision with Abram and changes his name to Abraham. At this point, Abraham is 99 years old and Ishmael is 13. In chapter 18, the Lord appears to Abraham and promises that he shall have a son in a year's time. Also, Abraham pleads the case of Sodom, that if only ten people should be found that are righteous, he will spare it. In chapter 20, Abraham once again has Sarah pretend to be his sister in the Negev, where Abimelech is king of Gerar. In chapter 21, Abraham and Sarah are finally blessed with a son, Isaac. Friction occurs between Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac, and they are sent away. Abraham continues to grow and be blessed. And Abimelech, worried about the threat of Abraham's success, makes a covenant with him. Certainly, Abraham must have had more going on than this in those 40 years, but this is all that God has revealed in Scripture. It is now in chapter 22 that we are told, after these things, God tested Abraham. Abraham has certainly had his share of experiences to prove himself in the 100 plus years of his existence. Has life been easy? Perhaps. What do you think? Yes, he's had to wait an extraordinary amount of time for his son Isaac. Beyond this, he has become wealthy and seemingly everywhere he sets his foot, he has found success. One might think that the storms have passed and Abraham will ease into the sunset. But God has other ideas. 
With strong faith comes strong trials. We can be assured that God did not tempt Abraham to sin. For we are told by James in James 1, 13 through 14, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. What is happening here in Genesis is akin to what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We can tell the difference in testing for genuine faith and tempting to sin by the outcome here in Abraham's life. It would do us well here to note some of the parallels of Jesus and Isaac. Isaac and Jesus were only sons of their father, Genesis 22, 12, and 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9. Both were long-awaited sons of promise, Genesis 15, 4 and Genesis 3, 15. Isaac and Jesus were of miraculous births, Genesis 18, 11 and Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Both Isaac and Jesus' names were announced before their birth, Genesis 18.10 and Luke 1.31. Isaac and Jesus carried their own wood to their sacrifice, Genesis 22.6 and John 19.17. Isaac and Jesus were accompanied by two men, Genesis 22.3 and Matthew 27.38, where it tells us Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Isaac and Jesus both involved a three-day journey, Genesis 22.4 and 1 Corinthians 15.4, where it tells us that Jesus was in the grave for three days. Isaac and Jesus were offered on the same ground, Moriah, Genesis 22.2, 2 Chronicles 3.1, and Matthew 27.33. Isaac and Jesus both went willingly to the sacrifice, Genesis 22.9 and Matthew 27.12. The sacrificial offerings provided involved thorns upon their head, Genesis 22.13 and Matthew 27.29. Remember, Jesus was given a crown of thorns. In Genesis 22.12, we read, He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. We read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. What love has been displayed in these two sacrifices? Don't you think? And Lord willing, let's meet here again tomorrow and look at another of the great chapters in the Bible. Welcome to another in our Great Chapters of the Bible series. Our chapter today is Genesis chapter 27, Isaac Blesses Jacob. Beginning in verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare it for me, delicious food, that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord, before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats, so that I may prepare 
from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. Then Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse upon myself, and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go bring them to me. So he went and took them, and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger brother. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac his father, who felt him, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring it near to me, that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. And blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, Esau his brother came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? And he answered, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered him and said, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of the heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you both, when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. 
So she sent and called Jacob her younger son and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? Sibling rivalry is divine as competition between siblings, especially for the attention, affection, and approval of their parents. It would be easy to think that this is the way out to explain away this chapter as being the result of sibling rivalry. But let's not go there just yet. It will do us well to look a little deeper into this account. If we go back to their birth in chapter 25, we might get a glimpse into what is maybe at the root of this encounter. In Genesis chapter 25, verses 22 and 23, we read, The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. And further we read in Genesis chapter 25 and verses 27 and 28, When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. We begin to fill in some of the blanks here to help us grasp what is going on. Is there more to this? Well, let's fast forward to Jacob's time in Padan Aram with his mother's brother Laban. To give the condensed version, Jacob falls in love with Rachel and agrees with Laban to work seven years, after which she will be given to him as his wife. Laban tricks Jacob and replaces Rachel with Leah. Then he has to work another seven years for Rachel. Fast forward again to the end of Jacob's time working for Laban when he tells Rachel and Leah in Genesis 31, verses 6 and 7, You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. So we see the apple doesn't fall far from the tree as regarding Jacob's mother, Rebekah. Now, in human terms, we believe we have the big picture. But remember what Rebekah was told when she was pregnant with those boys in Genesis 25-23. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within. You shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Isaiah, by the agency of the Holy Spirit, years from then, declared about God in Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Interestingly enough, the Apostle Paul uses these two brothers to explain the mercy of God when he writes to the Romans in Romans 9, verses 12 through 16. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. There is a divine thread woven through history from the foundation of the world. When we believe that all that happens in the world is by the hand of man, it is then we must give pause and consider the providence of God as it relates to the course that winds its way through the will of God. It may be that the skeptic sees the unfairness of it all when God uses the cunning schemes of flawed individuals to do His will. Yet God, who knows the end from the beginning, 
allowed the favoritism of Isaac towards Esau and Rebekah towards Jacob to play out to his will. God allowed Jacob to become wealthy in spite of the scheming Laban's attempts to the contrary. We will follow that divine thread through Jacob and Joseph and Amram and Jochebed and Moses and Rahab and Naomi and Ruth and David and on and on it goes. Like Job, we struggle to put the pieces together and ask, why? Yet, reaching ahead to Paul and down to this day and on into the far distant future, should the earth spin for another millennia and beyond, that word spoken by the Apostle Paul to guide our paths with assurance. For we read in Romans 8, verses 28 through 30, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So we may ask, are you being conformed to the image of God's Son? And Lord willing, let's meet here again tomorrow and look at another great chapter in the Bible. And there you have it, another installment in our series on the great chapters from the Old Testament. I hope that you have been edified and inspired to dive deeper into the study of the greatest of all books, the Bible. And I hope that you will join us again as we shall look into more of the great chapters of the Old Testament. And may God richly bless you in your search for truth. Lord willing, we'll see you again next time.